Let's all stand and sing and get ready for a great service tonight here at First Baptist of Kingstown. assembled here to honor and praise you, to bring you thanks for our daily living, for our provided needs that you give us minute by minute, day by day. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who gave us eternal life and everlasting joy in our hearts and our souls. But Lord, we ask you now that as we uh, break into this service, that you tune our hearts and minds to the things of you, your love, your sacrifice on the cross, of, and the music that we will sing in just a moment, and the prayer time we will have to share our burdens and lift them up to you and lay them down at the foot of the cross. Be with a word that will be spoken by Pastor Mix from the Bible, your living word. And Lord, we just ask that you move in this service, bless our hearts, help us to be a testimony to you inside, outside, and everywhere we go. For it's in your name we pray, amen. amen. Let's sing another song. He lives tonight, number 112.
Bibles and turn briefly to Psalm 71. Psalm 71, this day in Baptist history, Thomas Montaigne was a commissioned chaplain in the War of 1812. And uh, the, local, the general called for a, a drill and a review of the army, which was to take place on Sunday during the preaching hour. And Thomas Montaigne, the chaplain, being ordered to attend this review, went on this date in May 31st, um, uh, 1812 to the quarters of the general in command and stated to him in a dignified and courteous manner that he held a commission from his country in one hand and a commission from God, the Bible, in the other. And by virtue of God as his superior in command, the commands of the military and this man's general order would interfere with the orders of the higher command and consequently the re review could not take place on Sunday morning. Thus, having challenged his military commander, he, uh, who immediately honored the word of God and ordered the review postponed. So that was, that was today in Baptist history. In Psalm chapter 71 and verse 4, the Bible says, Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked. Tonight, I, this is just the way the Lord put this all together tonight. We're going to talk about persecution and when, when you are put upon by others, or whether it be for your stand for the Lord or just because of their own sin, you're being attacked. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O oh Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with praise and with the honor, with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in, thine, in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth, because it's going to fail. For mine enemies speak against me. They that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. Listen. I don't know what burden you're struggling with today. Maybe it's a, 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 a co-worker that just for some reason has it out against you or whether other people, whether their sin is affecting you adversely or, or maybe it's just, uh, I don't know, you're being persecuted for your faith. Whatever struggle you are facing, God is not unaware of it. And the psalmist today said that the overcoming uh, of, of our troubles and our fears is found in the fact that we are in full gratitude of what God is doing in our life. The fact that God is using the things that are happening to us right now, the distasteful, the nasty, the, the ugly things that are happening in life that have happened to us in life, God is going to use them for our good. That is the definition of hope as you're about to hear in the next message. And the reason I say God put all this together is because I have a set schedule on prayer time and I have a set schedule on, on, on what I'm preaching on the calendar and the two have come together perfectly. And why should I be surprised? For God is in charge of it all. The psalmist suffered the bitterness of loneliness and separation from friends and the hatred of enemy. That's what verse 4 says. In verse 6, God has delivered him in the past, and that is his guarantee that he's going to do it again, verse 6. And in anguish, the psalmist felt, you know, they're saying, God, that you're not going to take care of me, but I know better because I know you. And in verse number 14, the other end of the tunnel, there will be sunshine. So regardless of who forsakes you, remember what God has done for you in the past, number two, one. Number two, I want you to remember your hope is in God's character and in his promises, not in your circumstances. And I want you to remember to praise him for the deliverance that is yet to come. You understand that the light is at the end of the tunnel. You are going to get through this. I refer to this, these moments as mud sandwich moments. Have you ever ate a mud sandwich? 
It's not pleasant, but when you're done with it, you're done with it, okay? You know what I'm saying? You get to the other end. It may be a hoagie, it may be a foot long, but when you get to the end of it, praise God, he got you through it. But the real deep thing that hit me today was you do not understand his deliverance unless you are allowed to be in these situations. That if you were never put in a place of difficulty under the attack of people who are ruled by sin, do you understand? If you're never put in this position, then you would never know how good God is. Any fool can pilot a ship on calm seas. It's only when the storm rages you figure out where your hope's at and you see where your deliverance comes from. So whatever struggle you're in right now, whatever difficulty you're in, no matter how you're being attacked, no matter how you're being maligned, no matter what you're facing today, I want you to know the deliverance is on its way. As you draw closer to the Lord and be faithful, remember nothing happens to you by accident. You are now facing what God has allowed in your life. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Whether you pray by yourself or you pray as a family, whether you pray up front or you pray in your seat, I want you to go to the Lord tonight and I want you to claim these promises. If everyone else forsakes you, it doesn't matter. Based on God's track record, you know he's gonna come tr through and you know that your hope is in him. So, so declare it to him publicly in your tonight and praise him because the deliverance is coming as she plays tonight. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask a blessing tonight upon these people. I ask, Father, that you would comfort every heart and focus every mind. I ask, God, that you would bless each person here tonight with a, with a peace that passes understanding. As you carry us through the storms, Father, let us remember how you've carried us through the storms of the past faithfully and lovingly like a, like a father does a child. And Father, today, we know you're going to carry us through this one just like you have, just like you've promised. And Father, what a glorious day it will be as we proclaim and praise your deliverance for us. Now, Father, we look for the return of our Savior. We look for the return where he will take us from the very presence of sin to the very presence of the fullness of joy. And Father, we, re we, we claim that, and Father, we relish it, and Father, we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. Brother Mike, lead us in another song, brother. Right. Also in Bible history in the late 1600s, a group of people decided they were only going to believe 12.5% of the Bible, Pastor. Just 12.5%. Today we know them as atheists. That's a math joke. You'll get that later. They're, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. You see, 1 over 8 means an atheist, and 12.5 and divided by, yeah, that's it. All right, brother. Let's sing. Heaven came down. Oh.
focusing on the last verse when it comes back around. All right, let's sing about the hope on verse 3. dismissed with Mrs. Mix. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, Brother Ben is Fasaroa. It got his car tag today. He's got his tags and, and moving forward. And so, yes, he's, he's he needs some, a few things. So if you guys want to talk to him, you got something, maybe yeah, he's still accepting that. And uh, what a blessing to have him here. And uh, God is blessing. So look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. The series was called Blameless, uh, and the First Thessalonians was a book about a church that was blameless, and, and now we're going to be looking at uh, what I call correction concerning persecution. You know, there is no such thing as a problem-free church. There's no such thing as a problem-free life. Now, this is the second time Paul has written to the uh, church at Thessalonica. Paul and his party were still at Corinth when he wrote this. And back then, they didn't have the postal service. You paid somebody to hand carry a letter to someone in the next town. And so the courier who brought the letter to, to the Thessalonians the first time came back with a positive report. And within a year, Paul is sending this second letter to the same church. I refer to them as the First Baptist Church of Thessalonica. Why? Because the apostles were baptized by John the who? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you never really thought about that, did you? Now, I taught on the trail of blood because those same marks that define the church of Jesus Christ and the apostles is the same marks that define us today. We are not a perfect church by any stretch of the imagination, but we do our dead level best to follow those same marks, those same doctrines that Paul did. So yes, I believe, it's my personal opinion, you do not have to agree with me, but I think, I think we get to heaven, you'll figure out God had it all in charge. And I, uh, but I believe you can trace our, our heritage back to the shores of Galilee, and that is my personal opinion. Some at the First Baptist Church of Thessalonica thought they were going through the tribulation right now. Did you realize there's cults right now, today in 2023, who believe that, that uh, you know, that, that Jesus has returned and now we're living in, uh, in, in the end time of millennia? And uh, uh, that's, that's crazy. But some had quit thinking, uh, some had quit working actually because, at Thessalonica because they thought, well, you know, just here in a couple of years, you know, the trip's only seven years long, so I, I, why work? You know, why put something in your 401k? Why pay your life insurance? He's coming back, and we're all going to live in the new kingdom here. So Paul puts a lot more emphasis on the end times in this second letter. He does a little more detailed chronology. You're going to like that. The final chapter, though, he does deal with problems in the local church because of those who have stopped working. Now, even a blameless church has problems. So he's going to assure the believers that God is using this persecution for their good. He's going to correct some of the false ideas about the Lord's return. Uh, you are going to find that, that um, you know, Paul was only in the Thessalonica for three Sabbaths, and then they ran him out of town. So that the fact that this church took off and, and still is functioning under the persecution, you know, Paul thought by leaving town, he would calm things down. But they, it really didn't. And they're still going strong. And so he, he's excited. Now, he will visit them again in 1 or 1 Corinthians 16, 5. He refers to his next mission trip through Macedonia where he will stop again. 
Um, the converts of this church, are, are there, was a, there were Jews, but the majority of them were Greeks and some influential women that, uh, that are mentioned by name here in 2 Thessalonians 3. He'll mention them by name. Um, while he was there for those three weeks, they did not support him financially, but he did receive mission um, support from the church at Philippi. And uh, like I said, they suffered persecution at, at this moment at, as Paul is writing to them again. So the basic outline of the book is chapter one is correction concerning persecution. The second chapter is correction concerning prophecy and the return of Christ. And then chapter three is the correction concerning practice. Did you like the alliteration? Did you like that? I, 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 I think it helps me memorize things. So as we get into the message tonight, look at verse number one. He's going he's to give them his standard greeting. It's a little different from the first book, but this one, it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's usual friendly greeting to the church and where he identifies himself and, and also these faithful brethren. Silas, his, his Roman surname was Silvanus. Timotheus, of course, is Timothy. And then he's writing to the local church there. Remember, the church is not everybody that's, ever, that's saved everywhere. It's the local, visible, called-out assembly of baptized believers who have covenanted together to carry out the Great Commission. That is the Bible definition of the local church. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, all of these local bodies will become one gigantic universal, but it'll still be in one place. It'll still be local. It'll still be visible. It'll still be a called out assembly uh, at that time. Uh, the reason I make a big deal out of this is, is that affects the way you do baptism. It affects the way you do the Lord's Supper. It affects the way you do missions. And so what you hear on the radio is not necessarily how things are in the Bible. Now, it, it would make life a whole lot easier if I ignore certain things in the Bible, I, I, I could, things would be a whole lot easier to deal with. Church would probably be 40% bigger. Now, this letter is really of divine origin, though. That's the other thing you've got to remember when you read the Bible. This is God talking to you. Now, he's using, he used Paul to pen it, that's for sure. And Paul's personality does come through. Because it, when you start reading like Matthew versus Paul or John versus Paul, their personality comes through just like if you found a note on the kitchen table and, and, you, could, and, 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 and you read it, you could probably tell which family member wrote it if they didn't sign it. Why? Because their personality, their word choice, their aggressive nature with a crayon, I, I don't know, just something would tell you who wrote it. But it says here, God our Father. That's different from 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, he just said from God, but he says, God our Father. And then he says, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this letter is proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. Verse 2, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I went through the New Testament writings of Paul and almost every one of them is like grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. Why? Because grace is the source of all spiritual blessings. What you need is more grace. You need grace for what you're about to face tomorrow. You need new grace every single day. Because you don't know what's coming tomorrow. You don't know what's coming down the pike. You don't know the hits. It's always the hits you don't see that knocks you down. So you need grace. Experiencing the grace of God means at the beginning that you're saved. The first taste of grace was the day you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In Roman, or Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved. It was God giving me something I could not earn or deserve or merit. Brothers and sisters, I need to help you something. We live in the greatest country on earth, praise God. And if God had called me, I'd give my life for the country. I love this country. But we are not special as, as American Christians more so than our brothers and sisters in foreign lands. Our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted right now in India, the Muslim and Hindu tribes are killing off the Christians, burning churches, right now, today, in 2023. Are they less special than we are to God? Because we're, our persecution is frustrating, I get it, it's frustrating, and it's upsetting, 
But nobody came at you with a machete today. Nobody burned your house or your fields. Nobody made, your, made you watch your children get hacked to pieces so that you would renounce Christianity. Nobody, nobody did that to you today. Now we get, in our affluence, we start thinking to ourselves, we're special. We're the super Christians. We're really special Christians. No, no. My brothers and sisters in Kenya are just as much an independent Baptist and, as I am. And they might even be closer to the Lord than I am because they have less distractions. Grace, we need it. They need it. But it's the source of all blessings. And peace is that wholeness which grace brings. How do you face the things that God has allowed in your life? It's because you've been given grace and through that grace you've received peace that other people have no concept of. Listen, lost people don't know peace like a, a believer does. It comes when you know that your sins are forgiven and it comes from God and Jesus Christ because you're in Christ. I am seen as, as, as ju I am justified in Christ. I am seen as all my past, present, and future sins have been covered in Christ. Why? Because of grace, and thus I have peace. Paul wanted them to know and enjoy God's grace and peace to the fullest. He wants, God wants you to know his grace and peace and enjoy it to the fullest. Now, getting into verse 3. We are bound to, to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now this is, Paul was astounded at their faith. He'd only been with them three Saturdays where he broke open the scriptures and taught the Jews in the synagogue and then the Gentiles throughout the week. And he'd only been with them maybe 21 days, 22 days, and that's it. And this church was founded. And this church was facing persecution and they were still going strong. You remember now, these are Gentiles. They don't have access to the Old Testament. You understand that, right? Nobody, you didn't have the money to afford to get somebody to hand copy you one and give it to you. What they had was what Paul gave them over 21 or 22 days. That first letter that they got was the next set of scriptures they had and they probably consumed it just, just over and over and over and over again, memorizing it, finding it precious. How many Bibles do you have? How many Bibles do you have? I saw one on the street the other day with the cover ripped off of it, a paperback, and I'm like, nobody cares anymore. We have so many of them. This is all they had was the first letter. And what Paul spoke audibly. And I'm sure they hung on every word. Except Eutychus who fell out the window, remember, in Acts. Except Eutychus, he, he, he had enough. Have you ever been to the place where you were on information overload? Eutychus was, he fell asleep, fell out the window. You'll read that in the book of Acts. Do you remember that? Okay, yeah, stay with me now. Stay with me, don't fall out. I'm not Paul. I may not be able to resurrect you if you hit your head real hard. Okay. He says, we're bound to give thanks. I am in awe of your faith. I am in awe of the fact that you are standing strong in the face of this. And you don't deserve this persecution. You are God's people doing God's work, God's way with what information you have. And you're standing strong. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly. It's only in the valley your faith grows. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. You have these victories in your life. The day you got saved, the day you got baptized, the day you came to understand the word of God is actually the word of God. And the fact that you realized you couldn't lose it and the fact that you saw God starting answering your prayers, these are mountaintops experiences and that's exciting. But it's only because you went through the valley that your prayer life got deeper and your faith grew because when you came out into the sunshine of God's love and God's blessing at the end, you saw God in a new and a fresh way and went, what? Wow, it's real. Do you ever had that moment where you just went, wow, God's real. You know, I believed it, 
And I thought I was doing pretty good, but now I really, really believe it because I've seen God answer that prayer. I've seen God do something in my life. I've seen him answer and come through. And Paul is like, it is meat or meaning it's, it's worthy or of merit. He felt duty bound to thank the people at the First Baptist Church of, of Thessalonica and go, wow, you guys are doing great. Circumstances of their spiritual condition just compelled him to shout praise because in normal, in normal circumstances, we think to ourselves, there's no reason why they would stay faithful because your faith groweth exceedingly. I read this story today in, um, in, in a book called Jesus Freaks and it's about martyrs and it was about a teenage girl who'd gotten saved. She was a servant in, uh, in a household and um, she had a copy of the New Testament. And it, she worked for the mayor of the town. And when the, when the priests from the Catholic Church showed up, they wanted, they'd heard there was a Bible in the house. There was a Bible in town or something. And they'd gone house to house and room to room, and they found it. And, she, and, the, and, and the, 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 the mayor kept saying, no, no, well, she just owns it. She doesn't really read it. He go, she goes, no, no, I won't live that lie. I read it. I know Jesus as my personal savior. It's my most prized possession. They tied her up and put her in an alcove in a wall of the city and started to brick it up. And every so often they'd stop and go, now listen, if you'll recount, if you'll, just, if you'll say you're not, a believer, you're not one of these accursed Baptists, we will, we will let you go. You will, you will suffocate in this wall. She said, no, no, I, he died for me. Why wouldn't I die for him? And they bricked her up with the last brick in front of her face. She still said, he died for me. Why would I not die for him? And they bricked her in the wall. A hundred years later, they opened the wall and got her bones out and buried her in the cemetery. But that's persecution. That's somebody really coming after your life because you're a believer. And Paul was astounded because in normal circumstances, you'd think to yourself, they didn't know enough to really walk it, but they knew Jesus, and that was enough. Your faith always grows as your, as your knowledge of God and your intimacy with him in prayer grows. Their faith had grown beyond his hopes. They're not just saving faith, but the saving faith they had produced godly works because they were saved. 1 John 3, 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Saving faith will produce a love for a God's children. They also express charity. Do you see that there in verse? Um, he says, I brethren... Because your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you toward each other. Brothers and sisters, we are the children of God. We are the family of God. You belong to the church of God. There shouldn't be anything that divides us. We ought to be willing to ask for forgiveness and mean it. We ought to be willing to forgive. But, you know, if you're not willing to, to humble your pride and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? You're in greater sin than whatever it is you did to offend the brother. Because now that is a willful obstinance of pride that is causing division and discord, and it's something God hates. And brothers and sisters, I cannot defend you from what God is going to do to break your pride. When you sin against a brother or sister, you need to say you're sorry. You need to come and admit it. You need to acknowledge it. You need to own it. You need to say I'm sorry, and you need to change your behavior. Well, that's just the way I am. You know, I said that to my pastor, and he said, John, maybe you ought to change your personality. That's just my personality. I'm a Yankee. He said, maybe you ought to change that. There's no excuse to be offensive when you realize you're being offensive and not back up a step and go, I'm sorry. It's a greater sin. It's what causes us to love people. We should love people because of the grace that God has bestowed upon us. Amen. Our faith always grows as we come to know more about him and know him more intimately, and it becomes expressed in active love 
toward brothers and sisters in Christ. And there was an evident, abundant love in this church of believers who were being persecuted, and the testimony got back to Corinth where Paul was. And this was in such, such opp opposite of what Paul's gonna have to deal with at the church of Corinth. You cannot grow toward God without growing outwardly toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a greater sin to know you've sinned and not make it right. The persecution they were enduring grew their faith and united them in love. Now look at verse four. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Paul and his associates were rejoicing because they were, not because they were suffering, but because they were suffering and, and, and being faithful and the, and the way Paul had suffered to get them the gospel was not in vain. Paul had gone through it. Paul had been persecuted himself and run out of town. And he's like, listen, you, what I went through wasn't worth or wasn't in vain. And look what you're doing. You know, Paul and his associates just rejoiced. And he commented warmly, listen, your patience and faith, your persecutions and tribulations that you're enduring. Patience and endurance under a trial. It's not about having to go through something. It's how you go through something. This church was undergoing that persecution, probably the same thing that Paul faced, but still. In James 1, 3, the Bible says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience. Now listen to what it says in Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. We glory in it, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience Hope. The reason I can confidently say without a shadow of doubt that God is going to do me good and not evil all the days of my life is because I have experienced that good. And that experience happened while I was patiently waiting for him to work the work he wanted to do in the midst of the tribulation. So read Romans 5 verse 4 and 3 backwards. I have hope because I've experienced it. His grace while I was patiently going through the tribulation at hand. It is this hope that grows from patience that enables us to live for God and accept. Accept what God has allowed. Now I admit, most of my problems are self-inflicted. Can I get an amen? Anybody? Anybody? Most of our problems we made ourselves. But when we acknowledge it and say, God, this was my mistake, this was my bad, this is me not obeying your word, I apologize, forgive me, I recognize my mistake, and I'm turning to you, and I'm asking you as I go through and make this right, Father, you'll use this for my good. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge it. I did this. So as you walk with God, and you're filled with the Spirit, and then you walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? When I, when I realize I've stepped out of line and I apologize and step back in, that's me walking in the Spirit. Go, oh, sorry, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done this. You know, that's you walking in sensitivity to the Spirit. It's at that point, whatever comes your way is what God allowed to come your way because you're not making messes as much as you used to. We still make messes. But as you walk with God, you make less of them because you know what the Bible says and you make different choices. But then there's still things that come your way. So you learn to embrace what God has allowed because he's already planned this for you. Like I said, nothing grows on the mountaintop. Nothing grows except in the valley. And it's only during failure that we learn. Success teaches us nothing. It's failure that teaches us. So, and don't go out and sin just so you can learn more. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Don't, don't do that, you know? <laughs> but as you make mistakes, as you have problems that maybe you didn't even create, God wants you to learn. He wants you to learn more about him. You see, when you read your Bible and do Bible study, you learn about God. 
you learn about him. Kind of like reading an autobiography of Elvis. You learn about Elvis. But it's when you obey God and make choices to do as God says, you learn him. Because you see him working now. You see him active in your life. You see he is the one bringing deliverance. Because your faith builds experience. During the patience of the trial, you build experience, and that experience builds hope. That's how it works. So real faith was always to stand the test of time, and real faith endures the adversities. But persecution is generally limited to an attack on a believer uh, because of their stand for Christianity. But tribulation is is the word he uses here in verse 4. That's kind of a broader term. That means all of the struggles and trials that come your way that that aren't coming your way just because you're a Christian, but just because you live in this life. Troubles are not something that we should find strange. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter number 4 and verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible reads, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which which is to try you. Don't, Don't think you're the only one, and don't think you're the anomaly. Everybody, I should be, I should be, well, what's that, healthy, wealthy, and wise? Isn't that what the prosperity gospel teaches? That, that everything you do should just come up roses? He says, don't, don't think you're the only one. Don't, don't think it's strange you're going through this. Don't think somehow God is trying you because you've been just exceedingly bad. Why is God punishing me? Hold on a minute. How do you know it's a punishment from God? How do you know? We live in a world wrecked by sin. People get sick, people get old, people die. If you remember Doug Whitten, who's a faithful member of this church, played guitar for several years before they moved to Louisville, his young wife of, of just a few years just died of cancer. And they were faithful in church, serving God every week, playing guitar, singing, teaching, working junior. I mean, man, they were faithful in church. Why'd she die? Is God somehow punishing him? No, we live in a world wrecked by sin. Yeah, it's tragic, and we, we love, but we'll see, Katie. Nothing's lost when you know where it's at. She's in heaven with the Lord. What about the baby that dies in the womb? That child has lived a perfect life, only knowing the love of his mother and father to step from a place of warmth and comfort into the fullness of joy of God's eternal presence was a perfect life. See, it's not punishment. It's God doing a work in everyone involved. Think it not strange concerning a fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Christ suffered for us. You're, you're just, you're, you're, you're momentary is something the Bible calls it. This momentary suffering you're going through is nothing compared to the exceeding eternal weight of glory which you and I will receive and enjoy for eternity. When his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. As they were persecuted and faced troubles, they simply endured it, persevering and with patience and faith. And he complimented them on it. Verse number five, Paul wanted to assure the believer of God's righteous judgment. Don't worry, it's payday someday for those that persecute you. It will be payday someday. The bill will come due. Verse five, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Paul wanted to assure believers, listen to me, he's using this persecution you're in to refine you, to teach you endurance. Number two, it's, it's, a, it's to declare that you are now worthy of God's kingdom because you stood fast in it. You certify other believers that you're gonna inherit future glory But it's also a a witness of the seal God has on the unbeliever of his coming judgment. God is going, it's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. What you are enduring right now is just a foretaste of what they will endure under the wrath of Almighty God. 
The trouble you are suffering is a foreshadow of the judgment of God that he will inflict upon those that have persecuted you. He makes it clear. That's why God said vengeance is mine. You let me collect the bill on that one. You let me collect the bill. I'll do a better job than you. I will repay, saith the Lord. We're declared worthy. That's what he says here. Being counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Clearly implied is God is allowing his people to face opposition, even persecution. It proves. It proves to whom? To everyone around that sees that you are worthy of his kingdom because you suffer. You are following in the steps of your Savior. Most early Christians face that privilege. Few do today in America, but I'll tell you, as you read, as you read Fox's Book of Martyrs or, or watch the voice of the martyrs, you find out there's brothers and sisters in Christ who are just as fundamental and orthodox and biblical as you and I who die for their faith, and they will receive the martyr's crown for eternity. Persecution is the proof of God's working on you. Persecution is the guarantee that he will keep his promise and a future place in his kingdom. It's proof that you're his. For all, all that shall live godly shall suffer. Pers you know, shall suffer. This is, this is the promise of God. If we expect to reign in the future, we will suffer here. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. You know, God doesn't spank the devil's kids. They're not his. But God says he, he, he um, chastens his own. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, in the Bible, Paul refers to it like childbirth and the fact that a woman is in travail and in pain and, and, and agony, but once the baby comes, the, uh, it, that's all forgotten for, uh, because they're holding a child. It's part of God's righteous judgment to use tribulation to bring his own people to perfection. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Verse number six, we God promises a recompense. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse six. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. When God judges, God is going to be righteous when he does it. Because God is just, we can, we can expect the ultimate righting of every wrong. God will repay. God will right every wrong. He will make just every injustice that's been done. And in God's eyes, he, it is just for him to do this. It's right for him to do this. You know, I've, I don't know if you, I'm kind of carnal, I understand that, but I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes pray and say, God, I don't think hell's going to be hot enough for this person. You know, have you ever said that? And, and then I'm reminded that uh, he probably said the same, somebody probably said the same thing about me before I trusted Christ. And thank God I don't ever have to experience that. But uh, you, you and I wonder sometimes, is, when's the bill coming due? When will that be righted? And by faith, we know from the word of God, he will right that wrong. He will right it. He will recompense it. He will collect on that bill for you. Well, you don't know what they did to me. God does. God, the Son, he experienced an infinite amount of condemnation in a finite period of time on the cross. All of the world's sins, past, present, and future, were laid upon Jesus Christ. The infinite condemnation and infinite penalty in a finite period of time. He was separated from his father as the God turned his face away. And the world went dark. The punishment is the other half of sin. Man sows and man reaps. God will pay back. Look at verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. I need you to rest in the fact that God has not forgotten you. God has not misplaced you. God has not lost track of the tally uh, uh, and, and, and debt of sin others have put in, upon you. And in that vein, he says, and to you who are troubled, 
You that are going through it right now, whatever it is you're going through, rest. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, trust me, it may happen before that, but if it doesn't, don't you worry. On that day, it's gonna happen. The prospect of relief from afflictions and torment is what he's saying. I know, I know what you're going through. I've been through it myself. You remember when Paul wrote and he says, I, uh, thrice I've been uh, beaten, or, or five times I received 40 stripes, and thrice I was beaten with rod, rods, and, and I was spent a night and a day in the deep, and I've been in, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils among the heathen. I know, I know, I know what you're going through. Rest with us. We are resting in the fact that Jesus is coming. The prospect of relief is coming. Rest is not appreciated, though, until you're tired. Isn't that true? Try to lay down. No, you need to, but you can't because you're not tired. Maybe you got a child like that. <laughs> They're a special blessing, aren't they? Huh? 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 You've run out of gas long <laughs> before that little tyke did. The Christian life on this earth is not a time of rest. It is a time of battle. This is not where the parade happens for the Christian. Do you understand that? Our rest is over yonder in the glory land. This is a place of battle. A missionary was coming back from the field. He'd spent his entire life, his health, his family had died and been buried on the mission field. And he was coming home broken, emotionally, physically. And as he got off this large boat in the New York Harbor, there were, um, uh, there were uh, famous people getting off the boat, the same boat, and people were, the band was playing, and, the, and everybody was taking pictures, and they were, it was like a ticker tape parade. And as he hobbled his way to the subway station, he said, Lord, I've served you all my life. I've buried my family over there. What, what is my, what, Where's my, no one's here to receive me. Somebody's calling me. I'll have to call him back. Um, and he said, hey, God told him and said, you're not home yet, son. You're not home yet. This isn't a place of rest. So God and his revelation says in verse seven, and to you who are, who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished. That is going to be payday someday. But that's not our concern. Our concern is can I be faithful? Will I be faithful? It's the only choice you have in this world. You can't control any human being on this planet but yourself. You cannot control the weather. You cannot control the stock market. You cannot control your circumstances. You cannot control your health per se. You can do things to make yourself better, but I've met a woman that was, that was the picture of health, lay down, take a nap, didn't wake up. It, you, you do what you can, but you're only in control of how you respond. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Peace comes from grace. And from grace and peace, we endure the, and face the trials of life. We develop patience during it and experience a track record with God and thus hope. Our Father and our God, we love you and we thank you, Father, that you've not left us alone, that you've not left us in a place without, without hope without your truth and without your grace. Now, bless now tonight, Father, whatever these folks are facing, whatever hearts are burdened and broken, whatever problems, whatever struggles, whatever decisions that need to be made, Father, give them grace. Give them grace as they've come tonight by faith, expecting you to fulfill your promise by your character in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music plays, won't you please, won't you please take a moment and pray.
Our Father and our God, we love you. And it is beyond our comprehension how you manage everything, how that you keep us right in the palm of your hand. It's beyond my understanding, Father, that you would love a sinner like me who makes mistakes and messes. And Father, I recognize that you're true and you are faithful. And Father, it is my desire to be as faithful as you are to you. And Father, tonight, as we go from this place, we need your grace. We need to develop patience. Father, for we know that we're not outside your care or your reach or your love. Bless us tonight as we go our separate ways. Strengthen us, Father, in our faith and our understanding, our confidence in you. And Father, help us to be mindful to praise you as you meet our needs, as you comfort our hearts, as you bring us through the end of each trial to a new and a glorious day where we see you anew and afresh in a better and more clear way. And may others be pointed to you because of it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the other thing I want you to remember as a church family is you do not know what the other person sitting next to you is going through. Be sweet with your words. Be kind. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because one another, beloved, if it's not your day today to be in the midst of it, it will be soon. It always, you're either going into one, in the midst of one, or coming out of one. And so is the person sitting next to you. Be kind, be sweet. Now, tonight, let me see if I've got my, uh, I've got my pulpit sheet, I just rarely use it. All right, June 10th is the VBS uh, Neighborhood Outreach, but we're gonna go out this weekend. This Saturday is prayer breakfast at 8.30, and the, or at 8 o'clock, excuse me, 8 o'clock. What time is it? 8 o'clock. And then we're going to go out canvassing at 10. Brother Antonio has us organized for that. We're also going out Saturday, June 10th. And then June 11th starts our summer family nights. These are child-included services. They're going to be involved in the singing. They're going to be involved. Maybe you've got a Bible verse your family's working on. Let those kids come up here with you and, and say a Bible verse. Maybe you guys sing a song at the kitchen table. Come up here and sing a song. And, and every night, the, the messages and the music will be geared to both the children as well as parents. It'll be a whole family affair. There is This is, this is uh, for the whole family. And then we'll go out and we'll have an activity afterwards, after the message is over. So come. It's still Still at 5.30 on those Sunday nights. And then um, June 15th, we'll, we'll switch from Saturday outreach to Thursday night outreaches, and your Saturdays will be open. So if you see somebody you don't know, shake hands. Friendliness starts with you. Let's pray. Father, as we go tonight, we love you and thank you. And Father, we recognize that there are burdens beyond our own. And tonight, we call upon you to reach and the need that is in this room. That, 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 is, that those burdens are lifted and, Father, strength is infused by your grace that others may see and take hope and also take a hold of salvation for those who don't know you. Bless us as we go tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.